All right, I'm going to be preaching on giving this morning, everyone's favourite topic. It's not my favourite topic to preach on, but it's good to preach on it every now and then to remind us, you know, the, the responsibility you guys have as a church, all of us have, to contribute to this ministry. Because, um, you know, the reality of any organisation, the reality of, uh, even of this church, is that donations are required for this church to continue to operate. I mean, think of some of the expenses we have as a church. We got um, the building, you know, that's a, that's a weekly expense. You know, some, some churches have uh, even higher expense for a building, right, because they actually, uh, you know, have a commercial lease. You know, we just rent this hall uh, once a week, so we've got to pay for the building, we've got to pay for the storeroom. Um, and then, you know, when you rent a building, you know, you need to have public liability insurance, otherwise you can't, can't rent a building. So that's, a, that's another $1,000 a year. Um, you've got to pay for a website, because otherwise how are people going to find you these days? So you've got to have the website, you've got to pay for the hosting. Um, phones, you know, you've got to, unless you want to use your personal phone, so the church has its own phone. Um, and then we have food. So, I mean, uh, Nathan and I were talking about this morning, like the church spends about uh, 250 to $300 every week on food, you know, that we, that we eat each week. Now, you can't eat food just with your hands, right? So what do you need to eat the food? Now you've got to get facilities, you know, you've got the serving utensils, you've got all the stuff, when those things break, um, you've got to replace them. So you've got the facilities, all the disposable cups and plates and spoons and forks uh, and all the equipment that goes with it. You know, we've got the kettle, all the stuff that you guys see at the back uh, and the equipment that goes along with it. And then we've got kids club as well and then all the equipment that goes with that, that had to be bought. Um, then there's, there's different software that the, that the church needs to, to run. So uh, what sort of software do we have? Well, we've got accounting software to, to keep track of the accounts. Um, there's also you know, software I use to communicate with you guys, so that costs a bit of money. But also the soul winning software too. So we, we use um, you know, a, 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 an application to keep track of the soul winning, and that makes it a lot easier. That, but that costs money as well. And it's about $1,200 a year, that software. And then all the AV equipment. So you got, you know, the speakers. You know, these speakers, I've had to replace them a few times because they, they break, you know. And then the screen and, uh, you know, and all this stuff sometimes gets old. I mean, I'd love to have a new, brighter projector, but this one seems to be doing the job. Um, you know, the computers as well. Like, this computer doesn't actually belong to the church. The last computer I bought, I, I used with the church funds. This one was actually a gift from my mother. So you guys may have thought that I bought this new computer with the church's funds. I didn't, because the church didn't have any funds, <laughs> right? My, my mum bought me a new laptop. My old one was starting to run really slow, and it's taking a lot longer to, um, you know, because that one was like five years old, and I do a lot of video editing. So my mum was kind enough to actually uh, purchase me a laptop because she just was uh, supporting me. She was excited about me running for federal politics. So um, she bought me a new laptop. So AV equipment, you know, all the, the stuff that you see, all the cables and everything, there's all the stuff underneath here that we use. And, you know, over the years I've had to, like, learn how to hook all this stuff together. Um, made some mistakes, bought some equipment that didn't end up being useful and things like that. So learning along the way. Uh, then you got Bibles. You know, we buy Bibles. You got Bibles in the back. That's, that, that's a few hundred dollars. You know, flyers. You know, we spend quite a bit of money on gospel tracks. Every time we print a run of gospel tracks, that's... You know, I think the last one, what was it, $600, $700 in gospel tracts. Um, you know, I, I love the, for the church to have extra money for financial assistance. You know, when pe sometimes people are down and out of luck, the church can help them. But right now, the, you know, the church doesn't have any extra money um, for that sort of help. So that's just some basic expenses. But that's not everything, right? So you've got, like, just those basic expenses that need to be paid for. Uh, but then you have the activities that require somebody's time. And this is why you need workers in a church. You need volunteers. What are some of those things that require time? Well, you need to have time aside to strategize and to plan things for the church. Things just don't happen automatically. You've got to plan things out. Whenever you have an event that takes time, somebody has to contact the event, figure out the venue, you know, spend time contacting everyone, letting them know what is happening whenever you have an event, whether that's a baptism or whether that's a social event. Um, you've got to manage people as well. You know, so when you try and get things organized for a larger group, you've got to plan to actually organize people, and that's time that's put aside for somebody to do that. Um, what about facilities management? What do I mean by that? That the stuff that you use every week, 
right? The storm, it doesn't replenish itself, right? Somebody has to put in that order. Somebody has to go pick it up. Somebody has to put it into the storeroom. So these are things that require time. Uh, what about social media management? Like that, that's one thing where I've completely dropped the ball in the church. Like there's not, nothing going up on our social media right now. Answering phone calls and emails. Uh, what about whenever you need to buy something, like you need to get a new piece of software or equipment, somebody has to look into that, right? You need to research that, you know? You, I mean, every time, think about when you need to buy a new piece of equipment. I mean, I never knew anything about AV, what speakers to buy and all this sort of stuff. You've got to look into that, see, see what stuff you need, how it all hooks together. Sometimes you buy one thing and you plug it together and you realize, ah, oh, this doesn't actually work. So then you've got to go back to the shop, <laughs> hide again, all this sort of stuff. Even with the software, you know, like I, I say to people, you know, uh, you know, sometimes you complain about the use of Spotio or the use of uh, SalesRabbit or the use of TMAP. And somebody has to take the time to, you know, try and figure out how these things are going to work. I'm, I'm glad that TMAP is actually free, but we had to figure out whether it actually worked for us. And, and thankfully that they're implementing like new features and things like that. And it's working quite well. You know, with Kayla uh, doing a great job with the, the food rostering and things like that. I'm not done. I'm only halfway through this list. So you got software. What about software and website admin? Right, so somebody has to take the time to update the website, you know, put information on the website, put photos up on the website, edit those photos. Um, then there's video editing, you know, where you've got to take, you know, the, the, the footage and you've got to take the audio and then crop it. See, all these things don't take a lot of time individually, but there's a lot of things that need to be done <laughs> to, to run a church. So you've got video editing, graphic design. What about accounting? See, I haven't, even, I haven't even done that yet. Or I have to put last year's financial statement together for you guys. I'll try and do it this, um, this year for uh, the financial year coming up. So you've got accounting. You know, you've got to take time. You've got to go to the bank. You've got to bank the money. You know, but this is just time out of the day uh, that somebody has to do. And then you've got the government red tape. Right, so there's, the, there's government red tape where you know, fill out paperwork you know, to keep your registration with the charity active and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, when we moved halls, do you remember we moved from the house, for those of you who started with the church, and then we moved to Punchbowl Baptist Church. Well, somebody had to go meet the people at Punchbowl Baptist Church, had to go check out the building. It's the same with the council, right? Like I had to go and look at all the buildings to see which one was suitable. And, and thankfully, we got this one. And then you had, to, you had to pick up the keys, you had to fill out the paperwork, you have to do all these things. I mean, it's no different to running any other type of business, right? And some of these tasks can't be done outside of office hours. And you say like, well, you know, you work full time and then you just do it outside of office hours. Well, what happens if the council's not open outside of office hours, right? So how do you pick up keys to the building you know, how do you pick up key cards outside of office hours, right? So I was, just, I was just blessed enough that when I started this church, I had a job that enabled that sort of flexibility, right? Obviously, like, if I worked a job where I was, like, a tradie or something, I had to be on site. It just wouldn't have even been possible, right? So I was just, I was just um, you know, luckily enough that, you know, God provided me with a job where I had that flexibility, where I could go during the day and run some errands, and then make up for it at night, and then you know just work at night time to make up for the hours that it took. And sometimes, uh, you know, when I would take leave, you know, I'd get like maybe a week or two leave. <laughs> Elizabeth would know. Sometimes I'd be running around crazily getting stuff done for the church because that was the only time that it could be done. Now this is all. This is like expenses, the things that take time. But but what are the things that you think I should be focused on as a bishop? Of this church. I mean, the things I really should be focused on as a bishop is prayer, Bible study, counseling, soul winning, you know, preparing sermons, trying to be an influence in the community. Uh, so, as I talk through these things, I'm just giving you a list of, you know, so that you as a church comprehend that there's a, there's a lot that goes on in the background. And as I talk through these things, it reminds me of this passage 
uh, from the Apostle Paul, actually. Or he says here, and, and you know, I, I, I sometimes think of this passage when I think of all the things that need to be done for the church, that you know, I'm not telling you these things because I'm complaining, because I actually have it a lot easier than Paul did. Let's look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings, often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers in perils by my own countrymen. So, I mean, I'm writing a list for you this morning, but this list is nothing like Paul's list, right? <laughs> I mean, Paul's list, uh, I would prefer my list to Paul's list. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. But look at what he, how he ends this passage. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Wow, so I mean, I don't know how Paul handled all that, but he, but he did, by the grace of God. <clears throat> well, that list is nothing like my list, so I'm not, I'm up, I'm not up here complaining. I just want you to realize that, you know, contrary to the common misconception, bishops don't only work for a few hours on Sunday morning, like people say. They say, you know, oh, bishops, oh, you know, they just work for a few hours when they preach on Sunday morning. But that's not the only thing that goes into a church, right? And that's why, ideally, uh, bishops and deacons would be full-time. Now, businesses sell products and services to raise funds. Right? That's what businesses do. Right? Businesses will sell services. They sell products. But that is not the model God has for the New Testament church. That's not how charities are meant to work. The way the New Testament church is meant to work, God's model is that believers, you guys, you are commanded to give a portion of your income right, to support those who are doing the spiritual work. So this is why, I think about this verse, I was just thinking about this verse last night, uh, Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So to put it in, I was thinking, like, how, to put it in today's uh, vernacular, that would be like saying supporters, right, believers, they fund the production of spiritual content, Right? but it should always be free to consume, right? That's how I I'm thinking of this verse, you know, buy the truth and sell it not, is that we, we, should, we should be spending our resources to create a way to get the truth out, but we should never um, charge for that truth to be heard, right? That's, that's God's model, right? And that's how most charities work, that supporters support the creation of that service, but then the service itself is... Free. Now, this model for the New Testament church, right, that believers give a portion of their income to support those who are doing the spiritual work, is obviously patterned after the Old Testament tithing model. All right, so let's talk about that first. I've got three sections to this sermon. First one is Old Testament tithing. Right? Now, New Testament giving isn't the same, exactly the same as Old Testament tithing. Right? But then they're patterned after another. So you'll see that there are similarities, but they're not exactly the same. Leviticus 27, verse 32, says here, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So what is a tithe? Right? The tithe was a sp specific proportion of your income. And I believe, I believe it's like 10% uh, of revenue. You know, I, don't, I don't think it's 10% of profit. So some people think like, you know, well, when you, when you tithe, are you just giving a tenth of, <coughs> you know, what you take home, right? Your take-home pay as opposed to what you actually make. Now, the reason is, is because in the Old Testament, the, the Levitical priesthood was like the government, right? So it was like a 10% tax. 
So it was 10% of whatever you, whatever you raised, right? Your revenue on your increase. Um, and then that way, you don't have to have this convoluted system of deductions, right? So this is why if, if, if I could push a button and change the way taxes are done in Australia, what I would have is you'd have a 10% revenue tax at the state level, right? And you'd get rid of all deductions, right? Because that's what makes taxes so complicated, right? What takes taxes complicated is what you can deduct, how you calculate profit, and all this sort of stuff. But if you just calculate on revenue, it'd be much more simple if you just had a low rate on revenue, right? And then it works a bit like a, a franchise. But then, because in Australia, you know, the taxes are taken by the Australian government, right? So you're giving to church is, is not actually a tax, right? So this is why you're, you're dealing now with money after the government has taken your money, right? Taken their, taken their portion, what is left. So different people believe differently on how to calculate the tithe. But, you know, I think the tithe was just on revenue because there'd be really no way for them to calculate um, uh, uh, expenses, and you can see that when you know when they when they brought forth animals, right? So let's say they, they brought forth ten animals, one would be given to the Lord. So you can see it's revenue; it's not it's not expenses. You wouldn't say like, well, in order to raise these ten animals, it costed me three animals. There's only seven. I'm giving one tenth of seven. They they didn't calculate it that way. So I think it's it's revenue. So that's what a tenth is. So so what did the Old Testament tithe was a specified proportion. It was a tenth, wasn't it? Uh, Numbers 18.20. We see here the law of the tithe. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land. Uh, so this is uh, talking about the priesthood. Neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. So you can see here that in the Old Testament, the tithe was there for the, the Levite tribe. Verse 21, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you see how we don't have the Levitical priesthood today, but you can see how the New Testament model is patterned after this, where you can see the similarity of, okay, the workers that work for a charitable organization like church are funded by the giving of, of the members that do work those secular jobs. Just like in the Old Testament, you had, you know, the other 11 tribes were given an inheritance of land so they could farm the land and, and, and have herds and cattle and things like that and do that sort of work. And then one-tenth of that revenue would be given to the Levite tribe so that they could solely fo focus on the work of the tabernacle. Right? Because the work of the tithe, they didn't charge people to go to the tabernacle. Right? So that's how it was funded. Verse 22, Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. You see, so they were given places amongst the cities to live, right? But then they didn't actually inherit the land like the other tribes did. Because why? Because a tenth of the tithe, the tithe was what they inherited. That was the Lord's, and he gave it to the children of Levi. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an, a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. So you see that the Levites were even expected to tithe of the tithe that they received. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So you see how the, the other tribes could thresh wheat and bring in the vines and the olives, you know, and raise the cattle and the, the goats and the sheep and whatever. 
But he's saying when the Levites did the work of the tabernacle, they got this tithe and it was as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So think about this model, right? Like if, if, if this model was followed in the New Testament, let's say if every member, every family gave a tenth part of their revenue to God's work, then really all you would need to support one full-time worker in the family, uh, in the church, is you'd need 10 families giving 10% to support one Levite family, right? Because if you think about it, if you have 100%, everyone gets 10%, they're left with 90%, then 10 times 10 goes to the Levites, but then they tithe 10% so that everyone gets 90%, right? But it wasn't 10 tribes giving 10%, right? How many tribes were there? There's 12 tribes all up, and you had the Levite tribe is, doesn't give an inheritance, there's 11 tribes left, but then the tribe of Joseph was, was given the double inheritance, so he had Manasseh and Ephraim. That's why you get the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim. So you had 12 tribes, which were really 11 tribes, but 11 tribes giving 10%. So it got me thinking that, like, okay, so maybe, you know, the 10 tribes worth of tithes was to support the Levites, and then really only one additional tribe was required to pay for maybe the expenses of the tabernacle, right? Just the things that they needed to, to run the tabernacle. So 11 tribes were commanded to tithe. Now, this Old Testament tithe, this is why it's different, because one is the specified proportion, right? It was, it was a duty, it was 10%. It was a specified proportion. And this Old Testament tithe, it wasn't an offering. Right? It was, it was a debt, meaning like that belonged to God. And if you kept it, you were actually robbing God. Right? It's not like you gave an offering and when you gave your tithe, that's like something you donated to the tabernacle. If you did not give the tithe, you were actually stealing God's money because God had commanded 10% was his and it was giving to the Levites. So if they did not give the tithe, they were actually taking from God. Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So a lot of people will use this verse to encourage people to give to church. I don't think it's the right mindset, right? Because the mindset in the New Testament is not if you don't obey the Lord in any way, like whether it's in commandments, and this is one of the commandments, to give a tithe, then that you're cursed, and God is cursing you, and you're, you know, because the New Testament mentality is different, right? The New Testament mentality is we are under a covenant of grace, right? That we don't earn God's favor, that if we don't obey, we, it's not that God hates us, right? We are children of God, and out of love, we should be doing these things. And really, you know, we are stewards of something that belongs to God. So really, in the New Testament, everything belongs to God. The question is, are you going to use those resources wisely? Now, if we pattern after the Old Testament, yes, a portion of your increase, of your income, should be going to God's work, so God's work always has enough. Deuteronomy 14. Let's look at the tithe here. He says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil. So you see how even the people benefited from their giving as well. So it's the same here. Like you, you give to the church, but you also benefit from being part of the church and what the church does thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, for sheep, for wine, for strong drink, for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine 
household. So it's a bit like here, you know, it's like, you know, if, if I'm sure like if our church had, you know, the, the funds that, you know, that God would expect from us, you know, we might not have to eat chicken every week, you know, you might be, you might be able to follow this verse and say, get whatever thy soul lusts to thumb. You might want to feel like eating something else another week. But right now, we have to eat chicken because that's the only thing we can afford as a church. <laughs> have to get there. Our barricade chicken, the cheaper one. We're finding out that the crown charcoal chicken is too expensive. Now it's like a lot, bit, bit, more, bit more pricey than the albarake chicken. Well, look at this in verse 27. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. What is God reminding the, the, the believers, his people in the Old Testament? saying, you know, when he blesses you with good jobs and good fortune and all this, don't forget that you have a responsibility to give a portion of that to God's work. Right here, like, don't forsake the Levite. What's the New Testament application of this? Is that you don't forsake God's house and those that work in God's house, right? Where, you know, your house has all the nice things. Your house has all the new things. But God's house is like running down. All the equipment's running down. All the equipment's getting all, all the stuff. You know, it should, it should be provided for by God's people. That's the, that's the expectation. So, in the Old Testament, the Levite within the gates would be forsaken by the people of God. But in the New Testament, bishops, deacons, church workers, those who are trying to further the kingdom of God, you know, doing the full-time work, of a church. They're being forsaken by the people of God in the New Testament. Now, another reason why Old Testament tithing is, well, you know, why I don't believe it's no longer in effect, it's different in the New Testament, is because it was specifically put in place to fund the service of the tabernacle to the Levites, right? And Hebrews 9 tells us that these things, these ordinances, are temporary. Hebrews 9.1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. And then we go down to verse 8 when it talks about these things being temporary. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Do you remember how the Levites did the service of the tabernacle? And these services were only done, uh, were a figure for the time then present, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, look at this, imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So it is true that the Old Testament is, has, has this commandment of tithing. It's a specific amount, you know, it's, uh, and, and um, you know, if you didn't give it, you know, you're robbing God, you know, and it was to fund the Levitical priesthood, which no longer exists, right? But the New Testament is similar, right, where it's patterned after the Old Testament, but it's not exactly the same. So the way I like to think of it is, it's basically the same in practice, but the heart is different. Right? So let's go on to New Testament giving. How is it different? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, where we read this morning. Look at what the Bible says through the Apostle Paul here. It says, but this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So yes, it is, is it a, it's a commandment for people to give, right? Because it says here in verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. But what's the mindset that's different? In the Old Testament, if you, if you didn't pay your tithe, you were robbing God. Whereas here the question is, the, the, the amount at which you sow, how much do you want to reap? You see here? He says here, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So when we think about how much we give in the New Testament is, well, how much do you want things to succeed? How much do you want to reap from that? Well, that's how much you're going to give. 
right? It's like, so if you want a, something to be more successful, then obviously the more you give, the more funds the church has to use. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So you can see that that's different as well. It's not a specified amount, right? It's not just giving 10%. The question is, how much do you want to give? Because how much do you want to sow? How much treasure do you want to lay in heaven? And how much do you want to reap from that? Right? So let him give, not grudgingly. You see how in the Old Testament it would be grudging because it's like you don't have a choice. I mean, here, you have a choice. You can decide how your money is spent. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. See, God wants people to give what they purpose and how they want, them, what they want to give out of their own heart. But the question is, what is your heart like? You know, if you don't give to God at all, what is your heart like? <laughs> and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now this verse, I believe he is talking about, you know, people like myself, people that are working, trying to work in the ministry of the word, right? And he's saying, hey, the people that minister seed to the sower, right, where they're helping people to learn and to grow, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed so. See, so if you have a thriving church, right, then, then your work also multiplies as well because the work of the church multiplies and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many, thanksgiving unto God. So in the New Testament, it's how much you purpose in your heart. It's not a specified amount. And you will be rewarded based on how much you sow. So you may reap benefits in this life, you may reap benefits in the next life too. But the, the question is, you know, how much do you want to invest in eternity? Right? Now, what is the... the and, and, it's not, sorry, and, it, and it's not a specified amount, right? So, like I said, I just wanted to show you this passage in Mark 12. That it really comes down to, you know, your proportion. Because some people, they, 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 give, they may give a higher dollar amount, Right? but then that doesn't necessarily mean they're giving more than others. Because, you know, you have some people that may, may give a lot, but they give of their abundance. And that's why this, this passage is very good. But sometimes when people give little, they think, well, what's the point of giving when it doesn't really make a difference? Well, obviously, every dollar makes a difference. But it's not always just about how much difference you make with the money, right? It's about giving to God and the mindset of, like, giving a proportion of your income to God. Look at Mark 12, verse 41. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her of, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Okay, so that's some differences with New Testament giving. Now, what should be the frequency of the giving? Now, why do we take up, you know, why do I say, you know, she'd be taking up a collection every week? Well, we get this practice from the New Testament. <coughs> Look at this in 1 Corinthians 16. Now, collect, now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what is Paul saying here? Because Paul would travel around, right? And he's saying he doesn't want to travel to a church and then there's just some special offering that's taken up just because he's there. He's saying, no, the way a church should operate is every week you lay aside a portion of the income as God has prospered you and there's a collection taken up every week so that when Paul arrives and there's a need for that money, the money's already there, right? That's, that's the idea. 2 Samuel 24, so the frequency should be weekly. So this is why when you think, 
you know, well, how often should I be giving? You should be giving weekly as well. You know, you should be donating weekly to the church. This is why I'm always trying to encourage you to give consistently because the church should have a consistent weekly income which should be the proportion that you guys have purposed in your heart to give to God's work. Now, the last thing I want to say about New Testament giving before I go into my last point is when you give to God, right, when you give to the church, it should be a net positive. What do I mean by that? You should be giving more than you take, right? Some people, they eat at church every week, right? And you may eat $20, $30 worth of food every week, and then you feel good about yourself because you got to spare 20 bucks. You put it in the offering. I gave $20 to God. Did you give $20 to God? Right? When you take more than you give. Right? So if, if, you're, not a net, if you're not net positive in giving, you haven't actually given anything to God. Right? This is why I want to show you this passage in 2 Samuel 24. It's a great principle about giving. It says here in verse 18, And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So David's coming to Arana, wants to build an altar for God. Right? He says, I'm going to buy this threshing floor off you. I'm going to build an altar to, the God, to God. Around a senator David, let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good on him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did around her as, as a king. Give unto the king. And around her said unto the king, the lord thy God, accept thee. So what does around her say? Look, hey, if you need it, take, take the threshing floor. Here's some instruments, take it. Here's the oxen. You know, build an altar to God and, and make a sacrifice. Look at what David says. He says, And the king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Look at this. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Right? So, what's the point here? The point is, is that when you give, I mean, it should, it should be a net positive. I mean, if you take more from the church than you give, then you haven't really given to God's work. You're a net taker. Right? It's the same. Like sometimes, you know, this is a perfect example. I'm not saying it's this necessarily a bad thing. You know, people might, you know, get something that's like second hand. Right? They say, well, maybe the church can use it. Or they get leftover food. Or maybe the people at church can eat it. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But have you given something? No, no, you haven't given anything. Because what, like David says here, you know, like, I'm neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Right? So when you give, you should be a net positive. All right, so number three. So we talked about tithing talked about how it's different in the New Testament giving, but it's patterned after the Old Testament tithe. Last thing I want to talk about is full-time workers. Full-time workers. Now, in the introduction of this sermon, I talked about all the things that the church requires. You know, and this is why it's, it's ideal that the church has full-time workers. And when a church is small, you might only have one full-time worker, but there's always enough work to be done to keep somebody busy full time. So that's why the idea is like the Levites. See, the Levites weren't expected to also till the ground and raise cattle because the other tribes did not contribute enough. Right? What was the expectation in the Old Testament? The expectation was that the Levites could focus on the work of the tabernacle. Right? And that was their work. Right? So now, I'm not saying that you guys think this, but there are people within Christianity that don't think a church should have full-time workers. That they think what's expected of bishops and deacons is that they work like everyone else, right? 
But you can see from the Old Testament, that's not God's model. God didn't even give the Levites any land, right, to, to, to till, because he wanted them only working on that. And this is what I want you guys to internalize as believers. You know, it may be awkward coming from me, but I, want, I need to tell you guys this, because this is in the Bible, is that this is what the expectation is on you from God, right? That you, sh you should not accept being in a church. I mean, our church is seven years old. You should not be, accept being in a church having a bishop that's working full-time. You, you should be thinking, that's not right. You know, our church shouldn't have a bishop that also has to make tents like Paul. You know, you should, have, you should in your heart, you should be saying, no, we should have a bishop that can focus solely on his work, the spiritual work. And, and even more so, not just, you know, I, I hope our church gets to the point where we have more full-time workers. You know, that when we have, when we have multiple, maybe even multiple bishops, deacons, other full-time workers, where we're a thriving church that has the need for these things. That's what I want you guys to internalize. So a church should have paid full-time workers. And, you know, people try and make the case that Paul did not receive wages of churches. And I'll show you how they sort of understand these verses. Acts 20, verse 33. It says here, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, and that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Some people use this verse to say that Paul, uh, you know, did not receive wages from churches. And they say like, oh, you know, and, and you know, I understand that, you know, there are churches out there that, you know, take advantage of people and things like that. You know, there's always the good and the bad in the world. So when they say here, oh, you know, they'll use this verse and they'll say like, see, look, you're meant to be laboring to support the weak. You're not meant to be having the weak support you. You know, them slaving away so you can live in an ivory tower and, you know, live, live in a mansion, you know, north of Sydney while you pass for a church out in western Sydney, all that sort of stuff. But to see, that's, that's not how giving works. You know, yeah, if, if somebody's struggling, and somebody's like in the weak and they, they struggle, they're the ones that the church is going to support. But we're not expecting the weak and the poor to be the main givers at church, right? The main givers at church are like the working class, like you guys, you know, like the, the, the people that are living prosperously, right? Just to give a proportion. If everyone gave a proportion to church, our church would have plenty, right? So it's, it's not, this is not saying that, you know, the expectation is that the ones that we're meant to support are the ones that we're expecting to, to, give, to do most of the giving in church. No, it's the, it's, it's, it's the spiritual members in the church. It's the spiritual, hardworking members, you know, that just that make up any church. It's the working class. That's who mainly gives, right? Well, here's another one, 1 Thessalonians 2. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. So this is where people misunderstand that, yeah, there, are, there, are, there were times when Paul would try and set an example to a specific church and not charge them, right? But then you've got to ask the question, well, where was Paul's income coming from, all right? So just keep this at the back of your mind, and we'll see this later on. So yeah, there was a time where in Thessalonians, in the Thessalonians, where he might visit, and he didn't take up, because he wasn't the pastor at that church, Right? Paul was traveling around to all these different churches. Sometimes he would travel to a church and he would not take wages of them. Right? And he would say things like, he would not be chargeable unto them anyway because he was just there doing a work. But somebody was paying his way. Right? Who? 1 Corinthians 9. This is another one where people will uh, you know, use this passage. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 9. He says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power? When you think about power, he's not, the, he's not talking about the ability. He's talking about the authority, right? Have we not power, the authority to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So this is an interesting passage too, because it just goes to show that it was not the intention for, for these people to be um, uh, uh, 
abstinent, right? And, and, and to, not, to, to not have a wife, right? So they had the authority to lead about a sister or wife as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, see? So that's the first pope of the Catholic Church there. Um, you know, he had the authority to get married. Verse 6, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not, have not we power to forbear working? So even in this passage that they sometimes use to say Paul did not take a salary from the church, he's saying to them, don't I have the authority to forbear working, meaning to, to take a salary from the church? Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? See, so this is, this, is a, this is a good principle as well. Like, you know, when the soldiers go to fight, I mean, when you send soldiers off to war, I mean, do you expect them on the battlefield to plant crops and start selling things to the towns that they're in to buy ammunition and buy their uniforms and buy their tank? No, that comes from the citizens, right? The citizens pay for that to send the, uh, the, the soldiers to battle, right? Because you want them focusing on the battle. You don't want them focusing on running a business over in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever all the people go. Who goeth the warfare any time in his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? And who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So what is this saying? This is like when people teach that, that church workers, bishops and deacons should not be paid a salary. They're muzzling the mouth of the, ox of, the, uh, of the ox. What is it saying? It's when the ox is treading out the corn and the ox wants to stop and eat some of the corn, you let the ox eat the corn. Right? You don't muzzle the ox so that the ox can't eat while he's working. And this, this analogy is being used for the church worker. To say if somebody's doing the work, the spiritual work, then they need to be provided for, right? Doth God take care for oxen, or saith, it all, saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power of you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, so this is where they, they, they then quote Paul. They say, nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things. So see, the argument is not that did he have the power to take money from them, right? The question is, he did, why didn't he use it, right? So nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Right? So he's talking specifically to the Corinthian church here, that there was a specific reason why he didn't take it from this particular church, because why? Because they were accusing him of things, right? So he said, look, well, I'm just going to put this aside to show that I'm not in it for the money, right, at this church. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things, but he's teaching them that this is, this is normal. This is how it's meant to work. And, and you see this pattern. That's how it's patterned after the Old Testament. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? So he's talking about the Levites there. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained, that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things. So this is what they would say. They say, like, see, but Paul didn't. Well, this is where they misunderstand, right? Because Paul is saying here he didn't with the Corinthians. Neither have I written these things that it should so be done unto me. So again, you know, and this is, I, I can understand. It's like when I read these passages from a bishop's point of view, I can understand where Paul's coming from. That he's, trying to, he's trying to teach the church what, what they should expect. But he's not just saying it just, just to get something out of it. He said, I'm not writing these things that it should be done so unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. So he's saying, hey, I don't want to be known that I'm doing this just for the money, right? Because he, he's doing it just to glorify Jesus Christ. So I understand where he's coming from. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for some necessity is laid upon me. He's saying, hey, even if he doesn't get paid for it, he's still got to do it. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, when I make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now this verse is not saying that Paul did not get paid by churches. What it is saying is that 
he did not specifically take money from the Corinthian church for a specific reason. How do I know this? Because look at what he says in the second letter to the Corinthians. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God freely? So he's almost apologizing to them in the second, because you know in, this, in, the second, in the first letter he's telling them off for all this stuff. Right? In the second letter, you know, they've, they've corrected things. So he's like happy that they've repented, they got things right and things like that. And, he, and he's sort of, what I understand about this passage is he's saying like, maybe I should have, you know, allowed you guys to support my ministry and give to me um, so that you could have, partake, take, could, could have taken part in the things that I'm doing. He says, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God freely? Look at verse 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Now, he's not saying he robbed other churches in the sense that it was wrong to take money from other churches. But what he's saying here is that the work he did at Corinth should have been provided, his income should have been provided by the Corinthians. And he's saying to them, why is another church paying for something that you should be providing for, right? He's saying, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. So when you see Paul talking about laboring night and day and working hard, it's not this idea that he's like working like another job. It's that he's working hard in the ministry, but there are some churches that are faithfully giving and that's providing his needs. But what he's saying is that that does not remove the obligation of the church he's in to provide those needs because they have an obligation too. That's why he's robbing other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archaea. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, and wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So you see how he was doing it specifically in Corinth for a reason, because he was being accused of being a false apostle. So then he's saying, like, well, then it just won't. So then they will, then they're the ones that are after your money then they'll be accused of what we're being accused of. We'll just not accept any money to prove to you that we're not in it just to, quote-unquote, fleece the flock, which is what a lot of people think about church leaders. So, 2 Corinthians 12, For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not pertinent unto you? Forgive me this wrong. So you see how that's, he's explaining why he did it, but he's actually apologizing them. For, for, not, uh, not, for them not being able to, to have, have that privilege to, to, to support his ministry. So it's, a, it's an interesting thought there from, uh, from the apostle. Now, this is not just applicable to the apostles. Because in 1 Timothy 5, we also see the same model. You remember Paul talked about that you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Well, in 1 Timothy 5, we see the church's obligation to look after, to supply for its workers. Honor widows that are widows indeed, because this is when the church would take on a widow as a worker, right? And if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I want you to understand the context of this passage. Right? This verse is often used to say to a man, right, if you're not providing for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. But do you understand the context of this passage? The context of this passage is not talking about a man providing his family. It's actually talking about a church providing for the widows, right? Because look at what it goes on. So it's, I'm not saying it doesn't apply. I think it all applies. But it's this idea that 
there are, there are responsibilities for people to take care and to provide for things, right? Same like in the Old Testament, the, the tribes provided for the Levites. And God is saying, forsake not the Levite. So he's saying here that if you don't provide for the things that you should provide for, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Well reported off for good works. If she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refused, for when they had begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, look at this, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. So you can see there that Paul talks about him being provided by the churches, and then him talking about the elders in the church being provided for and using that same analogy. All right, so hopefully you learned a bit there, and you know, hopefully it encourages you to, to, to give to the church. Hopefully it doesn't discourage you. But just in conclusion... So what are, some reasons, what are some reasons people don't give to their church? I'm just thinking about some last night. One is, maybe people don't agree. You know, they don't agree that you know, the Bible teaches that that's the model that God has. You know, like so some people, hopefully you guys don't believe that. But some people believe that. They just believe, no, well, you know, I don't know how they expect rent to get paid and all these things because money doesn't just only go into salaries, right? Like money goes into providing the things that I talked about at the beginning of this sermon. But hopefully today's sermon has changed that. Another reason is maybe people are just selfish. You know, they have an attitude of, it's not my problem. You know, and that's unfortunate. And really, you know, the only thing we can do is really pray that, you know, God deals um, with your heart on this matter. Another reason people don't give to their church is maybe they're struggling financially. You know, you're struggling financially. You know, I understand. Like, you, you know, it doesn't, it's not easy to make a living in Australia. But, you know, you need to consider the two mites of the widow. That rather than just saying, I'm struggling financially, that I don't give anything at all. That you give what you can. You give what you purpose in your heart. And look at the, two, look at the widow that gave two mites. And Jesus said, well, that widow actually gave more than somebody who gives of their abundance. All right, so everybody should be giving, no matter how big or small, right? Another reason people may not give to their church is maybe, maybe they just don't care. You know, maybe we're just so spiritually cold that we, we just don't care if, you know, the, the ministry grows or not. You know, the ministry has what it needs, the church has what it needs. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate, you know, because hopefully... You know, in coming to this church, you know, you agree that the Great Commission is important, that more time needs to be invested into it. And I think if we have more full-time workers in the church, that we will do that a lot better as well. And, you know, hard times helps us to appreciate what we have. You know, <coughs> it's, like, uh, it's, like <coughs> it's like when COVID came along and then, uh, you know, you couldn't meet for church. People started to appreciate church a lot more. Um, you know, sometimes when you have a church, you don't appreciate what you have until it's gone. You know, and, and hopefully this church continues. You know, I will do all I can to see it continue. But, you know, a lot of churches have come and gone. You know, either they didn't have enough finances. You know, I don't know whether the finances were managed well or not. But what's worse is sometimes the, the leaders of those churches, the bishop of the church, burns out. You know, the family, you know, falls apart. And, and these are churches that are doing a lot more than us. You know, multiple services a week. I don't even know how they do that. You know, I mean, I, I struggle to just do the one a week. But, you know, they have like sometimes multiple a week. And, you know, so many ministers have come and gone. You know, because 
you know, like I said, it's not just a couple of hours on Sunday. There's, there's a lot that goes into creating a successful church. And the last reason might be that people just don't know. They don't know that they have a responsibility. That they, they don't know that they're commanded. They don't know this is what God expects from them. But, you know, now, now you do. You know, God commands his people to give to their local church. Now, I wanted to just finish on this passage <clears throat> because I really feel that this passage encapsulates um, and reflects the attitude I have towards this issue. And I think Paul sums it up quite well. Philippians 4.10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that, I re- not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving by you, by you only. So, you know, when you, when you think back of the verse that Paul was talking about, when he says the people that came from Macedonia supplied, I believe it's people that came from the Philippian church. For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. So remember how he was talking in Thessalonica when he was trying to be an example to them and not chargeable to them? Who was providing for his needs? It was the Philippians, you know? So the Philippian church is a great church. It's great. I hope our church is more like the Philippian church in, in, in many ways. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odour of a sweet smell, sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So I like that passage. I think that passage, you know, kind of reflects the attitude that I have towards this. And I hope, uh, you know, as I preach this to you guys, that you guys understand that this is um, the spirit that we should have in this topic. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And uh, Lord, I, I, I do pray for the people here. Yeah, no, it's not easy to, um, to give. You know, it's, it's hard to make money. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would put it in the hearts of the people here, that we would follow your model. That Lord, that those of us who, who work in secular jobs, We'll, we'll purpose in our heart to lay aside as you've prospered us and give to the ministry weekly. So I pray for these things, Lord. I pray that you'll put it into the hearts of the people here. And uh, Lord, may, may our church, you know, as you know, excited about future plans that we have for the church, and I pray, Lord, that you help our church to grow and to thrive and to help it be uh, the pillar and ground of the truth that you've called it to be. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.